There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode 10 of the Western Huntsman Podcast. Glad you guys are here. Thanks for tuning in. Um, you guys are in for a special treat on on this episode. I've got the director of the Idaho Fish and Game, Ed Schriever, uh, flew all the way up from Boise, Idaho, to sit down here in the Western, or I'm sorry, the Broken Tine Studio in Hayden, Idaho. And uh, we're coming at you with that interview. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. In the studio today, I've got Andrew Tucker, my cousin, who is an adult onset hunter, and he's joining me for for both this intro. He sat through the interview with me. Um, and uh, we're going to have a little conversation before we kick off the interview. So um, tell everybody hi, Andrew. Say, Announce yourself. Yeah, this is his debut on a podcast. Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, take it easy on me. It's my first time here. <laughs> <laughs> so so pretty exciting. This is my favorite episode, um, and we've got a lot of good information from the director uh, of the Idaho Fish and Game. Um, it's, it was a big deal to have him here, and I uh, can't wait to get into that, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I do want to, I, I want to, a, a couple of announcements before we get talking here. Uh, I, first, I want to send a shout out to uh, a buddy of mine named uh, Nate Davenport, who is currently working on the new logo for the Western Huntsman podcast. And he sent me several different renditions of this thing. It's looking super good. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. He's been, wor- he, you know, he has to deal with me. And that's that's a tall order. He's he's a tattoo artist at an Anchored Art Tattoo and Gallery in Spokane, Washington. So if you guys are looking to do a, uh, a tattoo anytime soon and you're in that area, be sure to check him out. Uh, Nate Davenport, he's super talented as an artist, and I appreciate all his hard work he's been doing for for the new logo. So I also want to give my my old man a hard time because I'm and I can't remember exactly if it was him that gave me a hard time about not wanting a doggy door in my house because where I live it, you know we've got uh, we've got all sorts of animals around here like raccoons and skunks and uh, mountain lions and hell we even had a grizzly bear uh, come through the yard and uh, which I don't know the, these most of the grizzly bears are, are pretty self-reliant and stay in the back country but um, this grizzly bear just so happened to be a Bernie Sanders supporter <laughs> and so he was just kind of looking for a free meal came down and ate one of the neighbor's chickens and didn't even pay for it uh, eventually got captured and relocated, uh, but that's why I don't have a doggy door on my house. So, so my dog has to be physically let in or let out, right? And um, well, my dad, my old man, he was giving me a hard time about that at some point when he was up up here visiting. He, so he he lives down in Utah and had a goddamn skunk come in through his doggy door and sprayed the shit out of the inside of his house. <laughs> Like the whole house stinks, got his dog. It, it's pretty funny. So I, I just wanted to give my my old man a hard time. Uh, what do you think about that, Pops? You should have you should have listened. You should have heeded my advice, sir, and not had a damn doggy door on on uh, that back door because he lives out in kind of a wooded area too. So I knew they were around there. Um. So Andrew, welcome yes. to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you're an adult onset hunter. Yes. I want to talk about how that came to be and how – because when you first moved to North Idaho, yeah. like you didn't know anything about hunting, right? No. And I, like there, there, I remember we, we went out a few times and, and I didn't know what you didn't know. And so it's been interesting watching because now you've got all this uh, – you've got all this good gear. You're geared up. Uh, you're bugling. We're, we're hiking into the backcountry and, and you're hanging in there like a champ. And so this has been like what four years? A four-year transition? Yeah, I think this will be uh, this upcoming season will be like my fourth one actively being out there. Yeah, I think that first year I went out like once or twice. Yeah, yeah. So it's been it's been cool watching uh, because it, it, you know a big 
it's it's fun for for guys that have been doing this a long time. It's it's fun to kind of have somebody that has never done it and seeing th- this passion develop for hunting. And what tell us a little bit about how you feel about hunting now. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Las Vegas, so we didn't have anything there, or at least um, nothing within the city, and it just wasn't a factor. You know, didn't yeah, have... your family wasn't real involved in hunting. No, and stuff like that. Yeah, no, yeah. it was the city life. Um, so moving up here, just going out with with family, and obviously it's a completely different landscape up here. Uh, it's been really fun. Yeah, we have water here. Yeah, and trees. Yeah, it's not just a <laughs> cactus and desert everywhere. Um, so yeah, it's been really fun and, uh, challenging, especially up here where we're at. And it, it's just been a a good progress and just, um, an evolution, I guess that I'm trying to, uh, speed up the learning curve because I I didn't grow up doing this. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so it's been fun and there's definitely challenges out here, especially where we're at, um, in North Idaho, it's super thick here. Mm -hmm. And the thing about me is I am navigationally challenged. I can get lost really easily. A one bedroom studio apartment, I could probably get lost. So <laughs> you've proven that a couple times. Yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> you've helped me out a couple times. So that's something that has been a challenge. It's been fun uh, working on those skills. Um, yeah, yeah. Not not just the bugling and the calling, but just everything. Being able to read sign and seeing what what's fresh, what's old, what kind of habitat. Um, is around us and just woodsmanship and yeah yeah and and like you said you don't know what i didn't know and to an extent i didn't know what i didn't know i I didn't know anything but i didn't know uh where to start what was you know uh high priority versus low priority what what i needed to pay attention to so it it was just a matter of getting out there and just experiencing it i guess you can't really prepare for it or, or learn it without getting out there so let's say you've got uh, – we've got like somebody listen to this that's never hunted. They they grew up in Las Vegas like you, yeah. right? And they're they're moving to a different state where hunting is just kind of the culture and the way of life or whatever mm-hmm. um, like it is here. What, what advice would you give somebody like that getting into hunting? I would say um, get to know your area. I think the biggest thing that helped me out was having people that I trusted that they could help me out, that you know could mentor me. Could, I could go on some hunts with just to kind of get – familiar with the area at first and if they don't have family you know there's always local groups on on facebook wherever you're Mm -hmm. at i'm sure there's hunting groups there um i would reach out to someone try to build some connections and just get your feet wet with someone that that knows the area i think at least for me again that goes back to to being uh navigationally challenged and not knowing how to um, handle myself in the woods um sure that's something that you know going out with you and other other family members um Help me out, and now that allowed me to to develop my own um, ability to do it solo hunts. And, and mm-hmm. every year, it's just a matter of getting better and, and further uh, pushing yourself. Um, and I love hunting now. It, it's I can't imagine without it. But yeah, um, yeah. the big thing for me was knowing my boundaries. So yeah. it, it's it's a fine line between pushing your boundaries and, and getting out there and pushing further, but not putting yourself at risk. Um, not, it's a good point, not putting yourself in a dumb situation or dangerous situation, yeah. because as much as I love this, uh, I love my family more, my wife and, and my two daughters. So I, I don't want something that could, you know, take me away from them or, or make them worry if I get lost. Especially you know. if you came across like a Republican grizzly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to work for it. So, um, all right, keep it being political here. I think that's the big thing is just, um, getting better, pushing yourself while also knowing your boundaries and, and um, it's okay to to learn over time and progress over time. You can't cheat the system. You can't learn everything in, in a day or, or even a season. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's certain things that you kind of have to grasp from the bottom and work your way up. Put in the time and and actually actually learn from scratch and yeah and, yeah. What's been the biggest surprise with hunting? Like what what were you not expecting about hunting? just how ingrained it can get into you how quickly yeah. um again not i i went a few times as a kid you know um lived in in utah until i was like six and we went a few times there but again growing up without it in my adolescent and everything life um now it's a big part of my life so just it's kind of hard to imagine like oh well you just started doing this thing a couple of years ago and and now you're a 
you know, I don't want to say obsessed, but I guess that's a word a lot of people use or now which is ingrained in you. Yeah. Um, just even on times when I'm out there and it's a terrible hunting day, I'm just getting rained on and by myself and things aren't going well. It, looking back, it's still a fun time. It's, it's still better, better than, than work. work. Yeah. It's yeah, still right. better than work. So uh, I think just how ingrained it can get into your lifestyle, how quickly, uh, I didn't really expect that or didn't know that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I, I, I always am interested in that perspective because, you know, it's it's different. Like, I grew up doing it, right? Mm-hmm. And and so I, I like what you said about not going beyond your – or pushing your boundaries too far. Uh, know what your boundaries are yeah. because, you know, it, it can be it can be dangerous, you know, and, and there's – but the way to expand your, your boundaries is to get out there and, and go to your boundaries every time yeah. and push it hard, right? Yeah. So, so I have uh, a couple stories on that. So – yeah, the first couple times I went out on my own, uh, it was not far from the roads, you know, and I, I, you know, made it to where I couldn't get lost. I kind of dummied it down, didn't really increase my success odds, but I made sure that I wasn't going to get lost. Then, um, you know, Onyx helps out a lot, obviously. But last year, I had a thing where my phone was cracked. My screen was cracked on my phone. So I'm using Onyx, and I'm hiking way back in. And it's pouring rain down on me. And and I'm like, all right, when I call it, I start going back and uh, my phone's not picking up my touch on my, so I'm trying to like navigate the course back and my phone just not picking. It's wet. It's screens cracked on the button I'm trying to hit like right in that spot. So luckily you always have a cracked screen. I know I do. I have bad (laughs) luck with them, (laughs) Um, but it's one of those things that I, I knew the area well enough and I had done it that kind of hike enough times where i knew where i was going but if that would have happened to me on my first time out i might have got lost yeah, yeah <laughs> so that's sure. something that there is technology to help but don't solely rely on that because you never know what could happen you could lose your phone i've lost my phone hunting uh you know and you don't want to solely rely on that too and you lost a you lo- what was that call the name of that call you lost Oh, what the, was the Hoochie Mama one? Oh, was it the Hoochie Mama? Yeah, yeah, I remember. We we scoured the uh, the mountain and find. I finally found you, found his Hoochie Mama. You did. You don't bring that thing anymore, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was okay. that was first year stuff. We're just grabbing whatever I read or thought could help me out because I didn't know how to yeah, do yeah. any of the calls uh, then. But yeah, that was no, funny. That was we went back and found it. Good times, man. That's a good spot too. And and really what. You know, one of the things is in terms of getting lost and knowing your boundaries and, and things like that, um, in, in northern Idaho or like northwest Montana, if you're in the in the woods here, it all looks the same, right? I mean, this is, isn't like Colorado or Wyoming where you can have these landmarks um, because you can see so far. It's so thick and brushy here. It's I think um, you, you're learning to navigate some of the most difficult woods I've ever hunted. And and so it's, it's an interesting concept there. But uh, we're going to do some bear hunting. Yeah. This year, right? Yeah, I'm excited for that. Yeah, we're go after some turkeys. Yeah, expand so, it out. It'll, it'll be good. It'll be a good time. What did you think of Ed, the director of Idaho Fish and Game? Oh, that was great. That was a great interview. Um, he brought up points, like points of view or, or other challenges that I don't think we necessarily think about all the time or yeah. that you were even factor in. So um, I don't want to like spoil anything, but as you get in there, he, yeah, he definitely brings up uh, just different areas of concern that makes you think like, okay, they, they really have to factor in a lot of different yeah. things in, in every parts. equation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I liked how we got into uh, the non-resident, um, I guess, topic that we all yeah. you know deal with and, and some of the strategies they have in place for that to really – make us residents feel heard and prioritized. So. Yeah, he schooled me on that one, man. I started bitching about the non-residents a, l- a little bit. And I, and I don't do that to the, that much. We need non-resident hunters. Yeah. Um, it's just a, it's always a question in my mind as to as to, to what extent, you know. But they were, like I said in the interview, we're non-residents in, in all the other states. So it's, it's, uh, it's good to have non-residents. So I don't want anybody to think I'm ragging on non-residents in this episode at all. Uh, I think it's important. Um and, and you guys will see what I mean when, when we get into the episode here with, with Ed. Uh, Mr. Shriver is is a good dude. I definitely have him on the podcast again. And I, that's kind of yeah. how I gauge a lot of my guests. It's like, okay, would I have this guy on the podcast again? Absolutely with this guy. I think he, he's got a lot of experience. He knows what he's talking about. He does a good job at articulating 
the perspective of the fishing game and some of the challenges that they have in terms of like opening up our eyes, um, my eyes, and maybe looking at certain things that I like to rag on them about uh, at, from a different angle. Like I, you know, you know how I am. I can be ruthless with with certain things. I get a, a super opinionated, and and uh, I go after certain decisions. I feel like they that they made that were so wrong. Um, but he shined a lot of light on uh, things in a, in a way that maybe makes me question my own opinion. And I always like meeting people like that. Um, I've said it from the beginning of this podcast, so it's it's always good having having somebody come in with that kind of perspective. I think he's a he's a really good director. Uh, he's he's the right guy for this time, and and uh, I definitely have him on again for sure. There's I think there's a lot of good content in this episode. Yeah, I think so. I think that like you said, we all kind of get caught up in our own singular point of view uh, and what we feel is needs to be, happen. And, and yeah. he does a great job of um, empathizing, but also stating you know, other points of view that make you think like, okay, that, that does make sense. Yeah. And, and, or things that you never even thought about. And it's like, Oh, okay. I guess there's more than it yeah. goes into this. than yeah. I thought of, he, especially when, when we get into wolves, um, yeah. man, he really made me contemplate a couple of things that I've said on this podcast. Like, well, okay, that might make sense from, if I was in the fishing game, um, Idaho fishing game, I, I'd probably have that perspective as well. And, and maybe I, I should, I should tone it down with some of the things I say, uh, just just because uh, he's right, man. They just uh, they have a tough job. They're, he's in a difficult uh, position where he's got a lot of different stakeholders coming at him from a lot of different directions. Um, and so I think you guys are going to get a lot out of this episode. Uh, so we should probably get into this interview, huh? Yeah, sounds good. All right, guys. Uh, again, this interview is with director of Idaho Fish and Game, Mr. Ed Schriever. Um, one last thing I want to say about uh, Mr. Schriever before we get into this is – it, it, it speaks to his commitment to you as a hunter. I'm like 500 miles away from Boise, right? The guy gets on a plane and flies up here because in his mind, it's important to, for him to communicate to the people that he looks at. He serves the hunters of the state of Idaho and non-residents, frankly. He serves the hunter, and he is a hunter, so he's one of us. And he took the time. This guy is busy. He, this is a guy. He travels every month, once a month, with the, the governor of Idaho. And he's constantly at the Capitol. He's, he's right in the middle of all the action, of all the decisions and, and processes being made at the Idaho Fish and Game. Yet he still found the time and made the effort to come and talk to us here at the podcast just so he could help facilitate and, and communicate some of the, the, the stuff that he's involved with and some of the, the concerns that we as hunters have. And, and he, he took the time to do that. And that speaks a lot about his character and, and, and uh, his commitment to, to us as hunters. So I really want to thank him for that. And you guys are going to really like this episode. Uh, again, this is going to be a two-part episode. Um, this is going to be part one with director Ed Schriever, Idaho Fish and Game. All right, without further ado, let's get into it. Guys, welcome to episode number ten. With uh, I am here with the director of the Idaho Fish and Game, Ed Schriever, and uh, really looking forward to this episode. Ed was kind enough to come all the way up from Boise to to sit down in the in the Broken Tine Studio here in Hayden, Idaho. I, I don't know if I'm embarrassed about having him in here or not because my shop right outside the studio is really dirty. Uh, it's become the catch-all for the winter, so um, I had. Uh, I, I meant to clean it, but uh, we've been we've been on the road. So hopefully, Ed, you're okay with all that. You're you're in a true North Idaho atmosphere right here. How you doing? No worries, Jim. I feel at home. Um, love your shop. So I I appreciate you coming up. This is uh, this is important to me. Uh, I think it's important to a lot of hunters uh, to hear from the director. It's it's uh, really neat that the director is willing to come on a show like this and and talk to hunters in Idaho. And uh, thanks a bunch for coming. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for the invite. I appreciate the opportunity, and I, I agree with you 100%. And, yeah. And uh, I try to be uh, approachable and accessible, and uh, it is a busy job, but it's worth taking the time. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's been good. Get, we just uh, we just had lunch here in the studio, so it's been good getting to know you, and, and I didn't want to get into too many details because I want the audience to get to know you. 
Can you tell us a little bit about uh, where you're from originally, and wh- how how did you get to where you're at now? Let's let's kind of walk through that. Well, I was raised uh, in a military family. Dad was career um, Corps of Engineers in the Army. My folks were both uh, native Oregonians. I got three sisters, one older, two younger. We were all born in different Army bases as as Dad was going through his career. Lived all over the place. Um, uh, Dad retired from the military, and uh, he and Mom settled back in Oregon when I was about seventh grade. Then he uh, he had another career with the Oregon Military Department as a civilian, and uh, so I grew up outside of Portland, about 30 miles outside of Portland, uh, my high school years, and then went to college at Oregon State, uh, studied fishery science, um, started to work for Idaho Fish and Game when I was in college. Mm-hmm. as a temporary, like many of our employees do, and uh, got hired full-time out of college and have spent my entire career with Idaho. My whole professional life has been here in Idaho working for the Fish and Game Department. Started in 84 in the lowest paying professional job in the agency and have <laughs> uh, worked in, in four different regions, and this is my eighth and last job with the agency. So it's it's been a a really neat trip, and and I really feel like I have a pulse of the agency from the ground level all the way to the top and uh, seen seen a lot of the state and done a lot of different things. It's been a marvelous career. That's awesome. So you And you started first up here in the Panhandle, your first job for the agency. Actually, my first job was in extreme southeast Idaho, down out of Grace, Idaho, at a fish hatchery. And then uh, after that, I went to Hell's Canyon and managed a fish hatchery that's actually owned by Idaho Power there below Brownlee Dam. Oh, okay. And I was there for about a year, and then I came up here. And uh, the Cabinet Gorge Hatchery came online in uh, 1986, and I was the first manager of that hatchery and worked there for three years. Doing a lot of cool stuff, mostly um, recovery of the kokanee fishery on Lake Ponderé. Oh, so you're the one that is responsible for all those dang kokanee, huh? <laughs> one way or another, I guess. Um, yeah. I, I say that lovingly. That's about the only thing I can catch on that Ponderé. Yeah. Um, it's a tough lake for, to fish for, for me for some reason. Yeah, and then uh, so after there, I, w- I uh, went to Lewiston and I actually went into fisheries management. So I was a regional biologist and then the regional fishery manager in Lewiston for almost 20 years. In uh, 2008, I got a chance to uh, go to Boise and uh, lead the fisheries program called the Chief of Fisheries. And I did that for eight years. And a few years ago, uh, I had the chance to be deputy director of field operations. Mm-hmm. And uh, worked with Director Moore um, for three years doing that job, and then uh, Commission gave me the nod to uh, to lead the agency about uh, 13 months ago. Oh wow! So, yeah. Wow. And how, what's uh, what's that like being the director of Idaho Fish and Game? Coolest job ever. Is it? Yeah. So yeah. and and you when you started at Idaho Fish and Game 30 some odd years ago. Um, what was that kind of the ultimate goal was to become director sometime or what, when, when did that become like a reality? Yeah. So that was really never the goal. Um, Uh I, I thought that I had, uh, had really hung the moon when I was the regional fish manager in Lewiston for a fisheries biologist and and living in Lewiston and you got the snake river and you got Mm -hmm. salmon and steelhead and sturgeon and smallmouth on Dwarshack and, yeah, Blue ribbon cool cutthroat spot. streams and the Loxaw and the Selway and and it was great and that job really let me work closely with the people that that interacted with the resource. I got I got to implement salmon seasons when when the hatchery programs really started to bring salmon back in oh, wow. 97, 98, 2000, 2001. Those were wow. some great uh, great times working huh. with communities Orofino and and Riggins on getting mm-hmm. salmon fisheries going. That was exciting. But um, just the opportunity just uh, came about to go down to Boise and, and start taking leadership roles in the agency. And chief, one, one thing led to another, right? And you were, you were chief of fisheries. Right. That's a 
that's probably one of the coolest titles I've ever heard on the on the podcast. Chief of Wildlife is a pretty cool. That's title, That's a cool too. too but <laughs> yeah. I, I don't I don't know. There's something about Chief of Fisheries. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you guys? Uh, so actually, we'll circle back to that. Do you, you? Your background is mainly with fish biology, right? And yes. And that's that's kind of where where it came to be when uh, growing up. Were you a hunter or? Actually, um, I fished very little as a child. Um, my folks were moving around a lot. We, we went on a few camping trips, and I remember a few of those camping trips included fishing. Mm-hmm. But uh, Dad was not an avid angler. Um, Mom really didn't enjoy camping, to be quite <laughs> frank with you. But uh, when I got old enough to drive uh, and my running buddies, and we just loved to go fishing. And I fished more than hunted. I didn't really get to hunt i was an adult onset hunter and yeah. um, just wanted it bad and so i didn't have uh didn't have a role model in my life that taught me that i just learned how to do it with my buddies and guys that i knew um and took off from there and and i would say for 30 years i've been a really avid hunter wow yeah how i guess i don't know how to ask that the right way We'll we'll go back to that, um, and then and you raised your kids in Idaho. I did, right? yeah. And uh, so our and you were talking. We were talking earlier. Your your daughter is your hunting buddy. Oh, well, I hunt with both my kids, but yeah. but she's really the goer. And um, um, my son and I get a whitetail hunt in every year, and we do a couple of sturgeon fishing trips in the canyon. And uh, my daughter goes on the whitetail hunt. Usually, she's had to move out of state now, but she does make it back every fall for our elk hunt, which is our big deal. That's a big deal. And it's, you, our, it's our big deal. You were talking, you do a little bit of uh, everything, archery, rifle, muzzle muzzleload, yep. um, and, and, and that even play, ties into the fishing side of it as well, fly fishing to bait fishing to shore fishing. Um, why do you do that? Well, because I like it all yeah, first. Me right? too. I like it all, <laughs> but um, I like... I like to uh, really be able to relate to all the constituents. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a one-trick pony. I, I want to know what archery hunting is all about, and I don't want to just read that in a book. I want to experience it. So when when I'm talking to archery hunters, I'm one of them, and when I'm talking to rifle hunters, I know that too. And mm-hmm. um, I, I just think it's important that um, I'm – I have a diversity of my outdoor experiences that I can relate to the people that that I manage and that our yeah. staff manages the wildlife for. I think it's really important as a wildlife manager to have credibility with the people you're working for. Sure, sure. And that's kind of how you view it. You, you're working for the hunters and anglers. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. When I was in Lewis, when I was a fish manager, I would have been very uncomfortable to talk to a group of sturgeon anglers about a regulation change if I didn't know what sturgeon fishing was all about and didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and that that kind of ties it. Can you kind of explain so people understand, and, you know, for me, what exactly is it a director of the fishing game? What, what do you guys, what do you do? I do a lot of different stuff, but I, I guess, um, so we talked a little earlier about um a bunch of information that folks can inform themselves about what the department does. There's lots of lots of stuff available through the website, through different yeah. places. But I have the, the website pulled up here. The too. law tells me what my job is, and so I'll just backpedal a little bit and say the you know the Fish and Game Department is 120 years old in the agency, and for a long time it, there was a state game warden. And that was appointed by the governor, and and this was a long time ago, right? Turn of the century kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, 1938 was really the start of the modern fishing game department, and that was about the Teddy Roosevelt era when the nation had gone through market hunting and wildlife mm-hmm. populations were at the low, and and um, lots of states were taking on professional management of their fish and wildlife agencies mm-hmm. under the North American model, where it, Wildlife is owned by the people and managed on their behalf. And so 1938, Idaho had the first ever citizens initiative that created the modern fish and game department. And that's to really separate 
politics from Fish and Wildlife Management. It made a board of commissioners. So the law says the governor appoints seven commissioners, one for each region of the state, and they serve at the pleasure of the governor for a four-year term, and they can be reappointed for a second four-year term, but they can't serve more than two consecutive four-year terms. Okay. They are my boss. The seven commissioners are my boss. They so, hire me, and I work at their pleasure, and I am their only employee, and they hire me to run the fish and game department. So it's – and I think that's important for people to understand because it's not you that sits down at your desk and, and says, you know what, I'm going to change elk season. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna add five days here and take away seven days there and and uh, you you don't do that the commission does that correct absolutely and so absolutely. you and it's it's kind of like if you're uh, it's real similar I was the executive director for for an association and uh, I didn't make the decisions the board of directors made the decisions I just carried them out and it's right. that similar kind of kind of setup then so it. If, if folks are interested in this, I would just tell you, read Title 36, 103, which, which talks about wildlife being property of the state. And it, mm-hmm. and it really says the mission of the department is to preserve, protect, perpetuate, and manage the wildlife that belongs to the people. Mm-hmm. And it can only be taken in such times and such places with such methods that will preserve, protect, and perpetuate the wildlife to ensure continued supplies for fishing and hunting and trapping for the residents of the state and others as allowed by law. And there's a lot to that. I mean, if you break that down, yeah, there's a lot to that. There and, is. And it is science-based. And it that law tells the commission that they're to base their decisions on the ascertainment of facts. Which is consistent with the North American model. Which and is it's, it's that, exactly what it says in one of the sisters. That means science-based management. Mm-hmm. So my agency, our job is to provide the commission with the best information mm-hmm. to inform the decisions that they make. And that's where our role stops and their role takes over. So the the other thing that law says that's important for folks to realize is it, not to cut you off, but sure. is that on the website Some, right here? Because I've got the website pulled up. The if you go to Idaho statutes, go to Title Thirty Six. Oh, okay. Well, I won't do all that googling right, right now. I just, so you can see the mission, and and it'll tell you if you go to the strategic plan, it'll tell you the overarching goals, but it doesn't really get into the law that that created the agency in 1938. Okay. Okay. Strategic plan. Yeah. All that. Gotcha. But the law also says that the legislature, so you go back to civics 101, right? There's three branches of government, Mm -hmm. the executive branch, which is the governor and the fish and game department is an executive branch agency. The governor appoints the commissioners. The commissioners hire the director. The director runs the agency to do the things that says in law. The law makes it really clear that the legislature establishes the wildlife policies of the state. Mm-hmm. The commission's job is to implement those policies where it is impractical for the legislature to set seasons. That is 100% the duty and responsibility of the commission to know when animals can be taken, how many can be taken to make sure that they're going to be here forever. Now, yeah. now you still, you manage within a range of possible outcomes based on what people want and the different interactions between animals. All of that is, is the science behind all the recommendations we make to the commission to give folks a diversity and a variety of opportunities across the state. Mm, okay. Yeah, I'd like... So, I mean, it's, it's good and bad. Bad in a sense that uh, I can't sit here and convince you to change the law on this podcast that benefits my hunting season personally, which I was hoping to do. But right. it's just not going to happen. It's not. No, it's not. <laughs> Can you at least share with me where the best elk hunting in the state of Idaho is? No. Oh, dang. So being, being director, uh, what – 
like what's the what's the best part of being director? What do you like the most about it? I like to get things done. Mm-hmm. And so uh, to be in a position, um, I like to get things done, and I like to be able to influence outcomes. And so when when your job is to run the agency, and the and you have policy or law, and then the commission is in charge of season setting, and they have to weigh social opinion, you know, mm. what people want, and you have to gauge what people want with what's biologically possible, and you manage animals that live in an environment that is unpredictable, and from one winter to the next, your survival rates of these animals you're managing can be twice as bad one year and twice as good the next year. So we yeah. we operate in a very dynamic environment. You can't just study it once and be done. You have to monitor these populations. Ongoing. Ongoing. Mm-hmm. And we say we manage for the public, but really there are a hundred different publics. There is not one consensus opinion from deer hunters in this state of what they want from their deer hunting. Oh, so, now I right? find that hard to you believe. You do find that hard to believe. <laughs> Not. So, so uh, really the art of balancing what's biologically possible with what folks want uh-huh. and giving um, people what you can, where you can, and again, it's a diversity. So we've got sure. some super high quality controlled hunts in the state where we limit the number of participants. And then when you ask deer hunters in general what's important to them, mm-hmm. the ability to go somewhere every year is super important. Yeah, yeah. So, I would agree with that. So that's that's one of the reasons why Idaho maintains a lot of over the counter hunting opportunity because folks want the freedom and the flexibility to go as much or more than they want us to manage for trophy deer everywhere. So we do manage for trophy deer somewhere and we manage for lots of opportunity in other places. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. Yep. For sure. Um, no, and, and I, I actually, you know, I've hunted a lot of states and I've been, I've been a resident in, uh, three other states during hunting season. Um, you know, Idaho is, we've got, we, We've got great opportunity here, and I think a lot of people get hung up on things that, and, and we're going to talk about this later on, but uh, I just want it on record from from my standpoint. I find Idaho <clears throat> to be the best state I've hunted uh, in terms of opportunity, in terms of public land, in terms of uh, liberal seasons. Uh, not that necessarily that's always a good thing, but it, it, it sure makes it, y- y- there's a sense of freedom here. In terms of the hunting seasons, and I love it. And you couldn't. Well, I don't want my boss to hear this, but I was I was offered a position in another state a few months back, and uh, it, it would it would have paid a lot more money, but the yeah. hunting was unacceptable. Um, <laughs> you couldn't pry me out of Idaho, and it's it's mainly because of the hunting. Well, I think that a lot of people share that, Jim, and I think that mm-hmm. that's a special that's a special thing about Idaho, and it, and it is a little bit different than some of our sister western states in that um, we really do try to manage for everybody Mm -hmm. and and a wide range of opportunities and we try to give um, deference to residents because the law tells us the wildlife of the state belongs to them to the residents and and other folks get to come here and enjoy it as allocated by policy. So there's a lot of things in rule that say we have a we have a quota on non-resident elk tags. Mm-hmm. There's only so many available to non-residents, and when that's sold, that's that's all there is. And yeah. and so we don't shut the borders down, but we do manage preferentially for the enjoyment of our residents. We're going to get into that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think, good. yeah, we're, we're definitely so, going to get into that. So I so, wanted yeah. to circle back because you said yeah. that, that about <clears throat> being a director. So working very closely with the commission, right? And as the commission implements these priorities, I'm the guy responsible to deliver on those. So mm-hmm. we adjust the, but your priorities are where you put your money, right? And, if you're going to do something different than you were doing, you have to reprioritize. You either have to have 
more resources or you have to reprioritize the existing resources that you have, mm-hmm. both fiscal resources and personnel resources. So we talked just a minute ago that things change and uh, elk population some places on the decline, elk population in another place is on the increase and you want to study the problem and you want to resolve the overabundance in some place, you have to be dynamic and you have to be shifting. And that's a that's a really interesting part of the job, being the, quote, unquote, the CEO, mm-hmm. is, is pulling the principal players in and say, how do we adjust this year in order to get the work done that we need to do this year that was different than, than last year? And so a lot of that, Jim, is is our planning process. And I know that sounds super boring, but it's really important that we have a elk plan. And it's mm-hmm. really important that we have a fish plan because that's where the public, that's the first place the public gets to understand what the priorities of the agency are and where we're putting our efforts to learn and add science so that we can answer the questions that need to be answered and we can and we can give the information to the commission to modify seasons appropriately to give folks what they want. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you give us kind of an idea, you, you just touched on it, of the multitude of different stakeholders that, that you have to, I, I don't want to say answer to, but in, in, in a way, that's kind of one way to look at it. Um, what does that look like as, as director of Idaho Fish and Game how many different angles are, are people coming at you from? 365 degrees, 360 <laughs> degrees in the circle. What? Who's who's the la- well? Okay. I again, I want to I want to make sure I'm, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to be better about sticking to uh, kind of my outline of, the, of some of these interviews and I because I I'm I'm like ADD as I'll get out I I'll get way off track here. Uh, let's let's circle back to. Uh, best way to prepare an elk steak. What's what's your opinion mm. on that? Well, that's not going to be a short answer. So um, I actually have a really good friend who I call a meatologist, and um, I I was challenged for a long time with doing anything with an elk steak other than frying it with some yeah. with some flour on it, and I love it that way. But what I really wanted to do was to be able to serve a medium rare elk roast that was tender. And so uh, my buddy worked on that a little bit. And actually, my favorite elk recipe is to take a small roast. It can be a big roast, but mm-hmm. usually you got to have like 10 or 12 people. So a smaller roast and, and uh, dry rub it with whatever you want. But I use kind of a barbecue seasoning with a little kick in it. Mm-hmm. And I'll let that sit overnight. And, and then I have an electric smoker with a cold smoke attachment on it. And I'll put that roast in the smoker at about 200 degrees for an hour. And then I'll turn it down to 135 degrees so it never gets above medium rare for 10 hours. Wow. And then you take that out of the smoker and put it on, just flash it on the barbecue about five minutes aside. And it's absolutely fork tender and medium rare and it's just the best piece of elk meat I've ever had. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, by the time I get done doing all these podcasts at some point, I'm going to have everybody's recipe, and I'll, I'll be like the most renowned cook of all of Idaho. <laughs> That's the goal, though, right? Um, and, and we talked about this a little bit over lunch. Uh, mule deer versus whitetail for you personally. Um, you got a favorite? Um, I love hunting both of them. Uh-huh. Um, I think just just for the exhilaration of the hunt and the challenge, uh, you know, the old question, why do you hunt? And the, and the reasons are a hundred. Um, but at 60, I really hunt to better understand the animal. I, th- I think if I boiled it down, I just love getting in their head and and being able to think like they do and understand why they are, where they are, when they are, and and what's going on. I really enjoy that about mule deer because it's big, open country. You get to see a long ways. You get to watch a lot of stuff. Um, but I probably hunt whitetail more often because I really like to eat them. Yeah, they taste better, they, right? Yeah. 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 So you, 
it, so if I were to ask you why you hunt, it's it's essentially you you like to get in, in their mind and and figure them out and is it is it like an out game them kind of situation it's the it's the whole challenge of the thing it's like being in their world mhm and and i just find that really intriguing and it's it's a it's a study that happens all the time i i consider myself a, an observer a trained observer by by occupation but well, yeah i just really enjoy understanding how they do what they do yeah i do too but uh hunting with my kids hunting with my daughter my son and my friends is a big part of it i do enjoy the solo i do solo five-day hunts sometimes but i like the camaraderie and i like you know touching base with folks and and especially i had a great pleasure of backcountry elk hunting with some guys that own stock uh, and we would go way back and just you know, very remote, and those are the kind of places where you depend on the people you're with. Yeah, yeah. You got everything you got, and you're going to be in there for 14 days, and that's it. You guys and, are going in on horseback, you mean? Yeah, and if it goes sideways, all you have is the people that you're with. Mm-hmm. And so that's just a whole other level, but uh, really enjoyed that. That was a real special decade and a half of my life to be able to do that with those guys. You mentioned five days solo. Are you going into the backcountry and staying five days in, in the backcountry hunting? or? No, just going by myself for five days. For five days, yeah. yeah. It's just kind of like a base camp kind of situation. Yeah, base camp, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I go back and forth. I, I, I love hunting solo, too. It's, it's, I think it's mostly because that's what I'm used to. But um, but lately I've, I've had uh, – we got Mr. Andrew Tucker in the studio right now. Uh, this is his debut visit uh, while we're actually recording, so he's he's been my hunting partner lately. And um, but uh, yeah, there's there's something about both of them, the camaraderie versus the solo. I I yeah, I don't know if I could say that I have a favorite over the other, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My my uh, my daughter took her first bull with a muzzle loader this fall, and I got to say one of the highlights of my life. Oh yeah, yeah, just very cool trip. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was in Idaho. Yeah. Awesome. That kind of ties into, you know, we talked about why you hunt. Um, can you give us an idea of what all types of hunting you do and, and uh, what maybe what your favorite hunt is? Without a doubt, it's elk hunting. And of late, it's muzzleloader elk hunting. And um, late season, it's just, it's cool. I love, yeah. I love cold and... Um, We've been hunting some places where you don't really have any cover other than topography. And when it's late season and you've got a herd and there's 200 pairs of eyes, it's tough. It's that tough. Is tough. It's tough getting in muzzleloader range. Yeah. And so um, it's, you're in elk all the time, but you really got to work to get in range and close the deal. And it's been a lot of fun. Did you, uh, did you get one this last year? My daughter did. Your daughter yeah, and yeah. you guys, uh, she pack it off the mountain. We both did. Awesome. Yeah, so that's part of the fun is when you're elk hunting and and even though we were not together, when you when you hear the gunshot, you know, uh, she sent I sent her a text. Did you shoot? Yeah, I got a bull down, and so super excited on a dead run for a mile and a half to wow. get over her help her before it was pitch black yeah 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 yeah. how how old were your kids when you got them involved in hunting 12 they were 12 yeah and they've are they both would you say they're both pretty passionate now as adults my daughter is more passionate about it than my son i think my son is more passionate about shooting he loves his guns he loves to shoot recreationally um but he loves to go hunting he doesn't work as hard at it as she does sure yeah yeah <laughs> well it's yeah it's not as important for in in his mind so if he's if he's into the uh, he does like what long range shooting kind of yeah. thing awesome yeah. what in in the state of idaho what does it look like from um from your standpoint with youth hunters is, is it is it something that's growing is it something that needs work where are we at with that that's a great question you know nationally there's there's a big charge in recruitment and retention and um when you look at when you look at who buys a license and how many people buy a license we certainly have guys the baby boomers are aging out of the sport and they've been Mm -hmm. holding the sport for a long 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 time 
But I do believe that nature abhors a vacuum. And I think that as those folks go, we will see more youth hunters come on. There, there are more folks getting involved in hunting. I think what's really cool is part of the fastest growing element of the hunting population is women. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important with kids. Yeah. Um, Mama goes, kids go. And, and I'm really excited about the increased trend of women who are taking up shooting sports and hunting. And how do you, do you, do you track, do you guys track that? Yes, Idaho absolutely. Fishing, like in terms of hunter's ed and, and license sales, that, that kind of thing. That's how you track it. I would absolutely. Say. And, uh, is that, is that like an initiative for the fishing game, um, to, to promote youth hunters getting more involved or? Yes. Okay. Clearly. Um, my, cause I have, well, she'll be 11 by that point. I have an 11 and a nine year old. Uh, they're going on their first turkey hunt. In fact, it's my first turkey hunt. I've never really been into turkey oh, good hunting. For you. So I'm, I'm going to try it. I even bought a, a call and, uh, I don't know where I put it. I was going to, I was going to see how you can call turkeys. <laughs> well, there, um, you certainly have an abundant population of turkeys up in this part of the oh, country. Oh man, I can yeah. run in, you know what's funny? I had, I had a turkey hanging out on the property here, right? And uh, I have this cat that's running around the studio, which I didn't know she was in here, but she's in here somewhere. She was hiding in the bushes and jumped on this turkey's back. And the turkey started flying, and she realized she was in trouble and had to jump off. She fell like eight feet out of the air. Landed on her feet. You needed a video of that. I know. It would have been it would have been like one of those viral videos. Mm -hmm. I was sitting on the front deck over there, and the turkey was kind of behind this wall behind us here. And uh, that was one of the most comical things I've ever seen that cat do. It was it was it was good stuff. On on kind of a personal level, what what do you want Idaho hunters to know about you? That I'm one of them. I think um, so many of us in the agency are one of them, right? That mm -hmm. um, we live, eat, and breathe it as well. But um, I guess personally, you know, I I got in this because I love fish and wildlife. But I really got in this because I want to provide good public service, and I want to serve the people of the state. I didn't get into this because I want to have the hunting regulations the way I like to hunt. Mm -hmm. um, I really, you know, my dad was career military. He served this country, and um, I thought that that was uh, really noble. And I am a public servant. And I really dedicate myself to working for the greatest good for the state of Idaho and the citizens that work here. Beyond fish and wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, that That's what I would want people to know about me. Yeah. Is yeah. I do this for them. And and you're one of us. You're, you're a hunter. And Absolutely. You're a fisherman. Are you a good fisherman? Yeah, I'm a good fisherman. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let's kind of let's kind of transition to the next segment. Sure. We kind of what I do is I generally I break these podcast episodes into three segments, and and uh, I just kind of wanted to get people to know you on a personal level, and I, I feel like we did a pretty good job there. Um, getting into the nuts and bolts of of Idaho fish and game. What can you give us kind of a bird's eye view of the current status of Idaho's wildlife? Um, I know that's just such a loaded, vague question. Yeah. But uh, kind of, kind of walk us through that. So first, um, uh, you and I got to talk a little bit before this, and I let you know that uh, once a month I go around the state with the governor and, and uh, the majority of the rest of the cabinet, and the governor holds uh, it's a it's an old time tradition in this state called Capital for a Day. Um, governor Anders did it. Governor Otter did it. And we go to small communities and we make ourselves available in person to answer any question. That Just comes. at like a city hall? City kinda? hall, yep. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and you get, you get to meet all kinds of folks from all over the state who have whatever concern they want to bring to you. And, and they frequently have concerns they want to bring to the Fish and Game Department on a, on a wide variety of things. But it's, it's a really cool time to, to get to check in with the governor. And uh, I, I just want to, you know, fish and wildlife and hunting and fishing is such an integral part of the outdoor heritage that is Idaho. And we are a fast-growing state. 
mm-hmm. one year or the other, we might be the fastest growing state in the nation. And, and that's got upside and that's got things that concern us as managers of fish and wildlife because there's only so many square miles of Idaho. Yeah. And, and biologically, there's only so much capacity. And even if hunting stays somewhat constant, the pressure of development and, and these things on wildlife, it, it all comes to a head at some point. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's a lot of people that are coming to Idaho right now because they love what we have, because they love this outdoor heritage and they recognize the importance of fish and wildlife and fishing and hunting and the just the family fun that you have when you go camping and you take the fishing rods or you introduce your kids to turkey hunting or whatever mm-hmm. that is. And uh, one capital for a day, Governor Little described that as the juice that makes Idaho special. And so we all get it, right? And and we're really concerned about keeping Idaho special. Does the governor do any hunting? Sure. Does he? Oh yeah. Awesome. Oh yeah. It's good to have a governor that hunts. Absolutely. Yeah. So you guys, so you guys do this every month where you go to a different community and just kind of interact. Like, yep. And and that's uh, I really like that. Do, does do you know if uh, does like every state do that or is that kind of more of a uh, no? Idaho? That's more of an Idaho thing. I kind of thought so. Yeah. I We're in a Cascade so. this Friday. Oh, are you? Yeah. Nice. So you're yeah. you're all over the place. You travel a lot. All over the place. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyways, well, I guess I well, I got us off topic again. Synopsis of current wildlife management. Yeah. So I and, think and is that do when you guys do those capital for a day, does that kind of help you as director of Idaho Fish and Game get kind of a pulse on on the way people are feeling? In terms of you know, actually, Jim, not so much. You you get the chance to answer some pretty pointed questions about somebody who has an issue with the agency that they don't feel has been dealt with appropriately or effectively. But yeah, that's that's really not where you're getting the pulse of anglers or hunters. Th- mm-hmm. Those are our public meetings. Those are the opportunities that people give us direct feedback. But my, my point about this high level interaction that people have with their wildlife whether it's consumptively or non-consumptively whether you're just watching a herd elk run across a an open field or you're on a fishing trip and you're watching the ducks you know um generally speaking across the board in idaho we're pretty good um i know we've got slight decrease this year in participation in deer and elk hunting we've got a slight decrease in success rate on deer hunting some of these things ebb and flow did you say decrease for deer yep okay okay yep. Just making- mostly mostly a response to you know um we came off some really good years mm-hmm. five years ago we had five consecutive years of super high mule deer fawn survival and the population got large and there were Lots of deer, and and we had uh, more folks going hunting than we'd seen in almost two decades. And now we've had a couple of tough winters. And and nothing drives mule deer populations more dramatically than tough winters. Nothing. So, yeah. So it's that's interesting. Is that is that normal when 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 we've had a tough winter? Do hunter numbers decrease normally? Is that like a Usually there's a little lag time. Is there? Yep. Usually, you know, especially after you come off a consecutive number of really good years. Mm-hmm. And people who maybe haven't gone deer hunting in 10 years are like, their buddies go, dude, you're missing out because it's really good. You ought, to, you ought to go again. And so you start to see some of those folks that are more fair weather mm-hmm. deer hunters and then the tried and the true every year, every year I go. Um, and... When success drops, when the mule deer population goes down a little bit, because fawn survival the last three winters has been 42 percent instead of 86 percent. Oh wow! Right, that's a big. That's cutting it in half. That's a big deal. And big so deal. Um, these are some responses to a smaller mule deer population, and the, and that's what I mean about doing business with uh, with animals who live in the wild environment that is not constant all the time, and there's different things that affect it. 
So we're sitting last week of February 2020 right now. How's how's this winter been? Uh, I mean, it's been mild up here in Panhandle, but curious how you guys kind of maybe look at indicators as how as to how the mule deer did this winter. Yeah, I think across the board it's gonna it's gonna shake out about average. So Is we it? should be in the mid 60 percent fawn survival rates. What what do you guys what do you guys consider? Um, well average that that the 60s is, is yeah average, yeah high 60s high 60s and, and you know years ago we were we were doing back to back to back to back 82 84 85 percent fawn survival and so when you get those kind of things and can the population can respond pretty quickly in a few years so when you have five years of good um survival rates mm-hmm. Can one winter destroy all that, or does it take a, a couple of bad winters to, to really have an impact? Most of the winter impact will be on the fawns, on the young of the year. It takes a super bad winter to take adults out of the population, especially true for elk. Yeah, oh okay. yeah, Especially sure. true for elk. Um, but it's the recruitment. Right, it's the it's the birth of the fawns that's next year's yearlings and next year's two and a half year olds. So the year after a tough winter, you can expect not to have many yearlings or fork and horn bucks out on the landscape. You're still going to have the the older bucks that were a result of the last three years of good recruitment. The, but they don't last forever. Yeah, yeah. Right, and that's this whole misnomer. That, that some folks have, and they think you can stockpile wildlife. And you've had these four or five really good years, and, and we've got a lot of nice mature bucks on the landscape. Oh, well, you need to screw the regulation down and protect those bucks. Well, you can't stockpile them. Yeah, that's not how it works. It's not how it works. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Is What kind of comparison is there for uh, – I've, I've heard multiple times that mule deer suffer harder – in the winter than whitetail. Do whitetail fare better through through the winter? And like, if so, how? Why? Well, whitetail, they just occupy different habitats a lot of the time. So it's so a lower elevation. Lower they're, elevation. They're they got a lot more tree cover. They're yeah. next to ag crops, and and mule deer migrate longer distances out of some really high elevation country and some really open country, and they can just just by virtue of the elevation and where they live, can be more susceptible to deep snow. And so that's what it is. It's more of a geographic thing than a, you know, a whatever physical issue one or the other has. Interesting. Yeah. See, I told you I, I told you we'd get off base. Yeah, we're way off base. <laughs> uh, give, give, us, uh, give us the mission of the Idaho fishing game. Can you describe the mission? So again, you could go back to Title 36103, and it'll tell you exactly the mission. And I can paraphrase it. I, I don't get every word right, but um, uh, Title 36 says all wildlife, animals, birds, fish in the state of Idaho is declared to be the property of the state. It shall be preserved, protected, perpetuated, and managed. And that's an important word, managed. Mm-hmm. It shall only be taken at such times or places under such conditions or by such means in such a manner as will preserve, protect, and perpetuate the wildlife. That's why we have regulations. That's why we have seasons. That's why the commission tells you when the season opens and when it closes and where where it's open because the law says you can only take them at such time and place with such methods that we know that's going to perpetuate wildlife. And the last paragraph, and to provide for the citizens of this state and as law permitted to others continued supplies of wildlife for fishing, hunting, and trapping. Hmm. That's that's an the important nut, point. That's the nutshell mission of the agency. So the priority is the resident. Uh, that's essentially what, it, what it's saying, which you, you touched on earlier. Um does that tie into why – and the only reason I asked this is I, I saw this, I don't know, it was like Facebook or something. Um, somebody was complaining that if if it's public land, why can't they get a resident tag, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people don't understand that you don't manage the public U.S. Forest Service and BLM. Um, you don't even manage the state land, right? You, no, the Department of Land. strictly does. manage the wildlife. Yes, sir. And the wildlife is managed – for the for the Idaho residents, 
or whatever state we're, we're talking about here, um, the wildlife that exists on federal land, public land, still is managed by the state, and that is why it doesn't apply if they're on public land getting a, a resident versus – and again, this is kind of a rabbit hole, but I, I see this a lot. I see I see people bring this up a lot. Well, if I'm, I'm, I'm in Minnesota coming to Idaho or whatever um, – why can't I get a, a a resident price tag because these it's on it's on on federal public land? Right. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, I think that that's just something that I always like to clarify things, especially when they like I told you I have ADD. They pop up into my head. I gotta say them. <laughs> right. So so we don't have a moratorium against non-residents, but oh, the, yeah, no. But rules as an extension of the law allocate portions of the state's wildlife to non-residents. There is an allocation process. For example, in rule, and it's been this way for 20 years, in over-the-counter hunts, not controlled hunts, mm -hmm. in over-the-counter hunts, there are 12,815 elk tags available for non-residents. How long has it been that number? Over 20 years. Over 20 years. Over 20 years. Um, Let's reiterate that point. Uh, again, anybody, if you're in this audience, and I, I don't want you to feel like I'm picking on you, if you feel like non-resident hunter numbers have gone up dramatically, but this is such a contentious thing that is all over social media, and, and Ed probably doesn't want to get into that aspect of it, but I will. Non-resident hunter tags have not gone up in over 20 years. So there's not this dramatic increase in non-resident hunters in the state of Idaho. So I'm actually uh, going to tell you you're wrong. Oh, okay. Okay. So that, that, that and, and we do want to talk about this because this is a priority issue for the commission this year. Okay. Managing the distribution of non-resident hunters in over-the-counter deer and elk hunts is a priority issue for the commission and is one of the things they told me was their high priority when they hired me as director. So well, we so let me just let me just back up. I told you that the non-resident quota was unchanged in 20 years. That means there's 12,815 tags available. But eight, eight years ago, we weren't selling them out. Gotcha. gotcha. Eight years ago, we were selling 7,000 of those tags. So there were 7,000 non-resident elk hunters hunting in over-the-counter hunts seven years ago, and now there's 12,815 because we're selling them all out. So they were 100% so sold out last year, right? 100%. And they're selling out earlier every year. So, yes, there has been an increase in the number of non-residents, but there can't, it can't continue to go up because we're now at the quota. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, that makes sense. And so, segue. I know you wanted to ask me this question on, on priorities for the commission. So, there are a couple other rules. For example, we, we're just talking about over-the-counter tags, mm -hmm. which are important. Idaho loves. Our residents love that we're over the counter, that a lot of our hunting, you can go to the counter and buy a tag and go. Yeah. And then we have controlled hunts. It's also been a rule for a long, long time. And everybody knows what a controlled hunt is. Mm -hmm. In unit, whatever unit, XYZ, sure. we've determined that in order to, to deliver what the public wants, we have to limit the number of hunters for species whatever if it's a mule deer hunt and the objective is to to produce whatever we say we can only have a hundred tags in that unit between november 1st and november 18th mm -hmm. so there's a hundred tags and a thousand people want them so that's our controlled hunt a thousand mm -hmm. people put in for the chance to draw one of a hundred tags yep and it's been a rule for 20 more years that in any controlled hunt, no more than 10% of the tags will go to non-residents as a maximum. Yeah. So that's in addition to these over-the-counter tags. There's a different rule for controlled hunts. So in no controlled hunt in the state will there be more than 10% non-residents. Some of them are less, right? Yeah, so the way the draw works 
if if you randomly pull a hundred names out of the hat and the first hundred were all residents, non-residents won't get a tag. If the first ten names out of the hat were non-residents, every non-resident drawn after that would get a, a blank because the ten percent of those tags had already been given away. Oh, wow, okay. I didn't okay, know so that. it's not to exceed ten percent, but it's all based on the randomness it's just of the randomness. draw. And is that is that you in your office with all those names in a hat drawing those out, or how does that work? <laughs> That's me in the back room. No. Um, so we act. We used to uh, work with the state controller's office to do that draw for us, but uh, there was a law change a couple of years ago. We now have that done by a contractor. So oh, okay. a third party contractor so third party does so does the draw. And we have to – that third party has to verify that it's truly a random system and, and all that yeah, stuff is done yeah. annually. Do so, you put in for draws? Absolutely. Do you? Absolutely. What's, uh, what's kind of – what, sh- what are you shooting for this year? I'm not telling. You're not going to tell me? No. Like, I'm like the friendliest guy you've ever met. You're not going to tell me? No. <laughs> um so that's a random thing through a third party. I didn't know that. And so, so, so when we're talking about non-residents, I just want to say the 12,800, there, we sell more non-resident elk tags than that because there are a couple hundred non-residents who get a tag through the controlled hunt. Okay. So, but that, but that, Jim, limits the distribution. So we know any place we have a controlled hunt, there won't be more than 10% non-residents participating in the general over-the-counter hunts Mm -hmm. even though there's a cap on the number of tags there is no mechanism that the commission has right now to distribute those non-residents across the landscape so what we what we have is some of our units or zones that have disproportionately high participation by non-residents and that's where we're getting some concern from our residents. Gotcha. Okay. So mm-hmm. the what the commission is going through right now, and it's it's I don't want to hopefully not jinx it because it's the legislature approves our rules, and the commission has asked for a rule that will let them manage non-resident numbers in each unit mm. by tag type. Even though the residents will continue to be unlimited, the rule will look at how many residents have been hunting over the previous five years and set a cap. I like that. For non residents. And it's, you'll still have the quota. The quota won't change. The, the 12, quota won't whatever. change, yeah. but the distribution of non residents on the landscape will change. Gotcha. And so these hotspot places, if you will, the commission will now have a rule to manage the ultimate level of participation to not less than 10%. But like some of our, we've we've really seen an increase in non-resident archery elk hunters, for example, and and they're they're limited to a few zones in the state. And so we could see significant, if the legislature stands this rule up and the commission implements it, we could see significant, up to in some places. 50% reduction of non-resident archery hunters, for example, in some elk zones. So, and are there's there's going to be a place where, where like resident hunters can make their comments and and one of it. They already on did. Specific- they already did. They already did. We've been working on this rule all through 2019. And that that's where all those meetings kind that's of came That's what out. all, all those, those meetings, meetings and from last so year. How do people get engaged, Jim? This is how people get engaged. We ran this rule. We had 350 some people comment on it. 94 percent support from resident hunters for the commission's ability to manage non-resident distribution in open general hunts. See, I'm really glad you clarified this because this this has been in, and I don't know why I let it bother me. But I get people's point. It is irritating as hell sometimes when you're when you're in an area that that you've been hunting for a long time, and you're seeing all these out of state trucks. Mm-hmm. Um, they're 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 clogging up the spots to camp. They're clogging up the the drainages you used to hunt, and and that's the feeling. And I know a lot of that is just perception. And a lot of units are they get they get hammered by non residents. But I, I and I was under the wrong impression. I didn't know that there'd been an increase in tags sold. 
Uh, I just thought they was they they've been selling out for a long time. So I, I did, that's only the last four or five years, you said. Yes. Yeah, so they used to. This, this is this is one of these trough things, right? So uh-huh. um, 99, 98, 97, 96, non-resident tags were selling out every year. And, and some of those, you go back 20 years, non-resident elk tags were sold by March. Mm. So the numbers that we have now aren't any different than they were back then. The distribution of where they go might be different. More of them might be archery hunters than they used to be rifle hunters, but um, the sale mm. of non-resident tags under the cap has changed quite a bit in the last ten years. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah, because yeah, I I, I was uh, I had a little misconception there. So um, this is this is one of those things that's, you know, what's cool about being the director. The commission says, you know, we've heard from our hunters for a long time that. We've got a piece of the puzzle missing here that we really need to be able to manage the distribution of non-residents because it is conceivable under the framework. It doesn't happen, but it's conceivable that all 12,800 non-resident elk hunters would go to one zone. There, oh, sure. there isn't any mechanism that would limit that. Yeah, that would be problematic. Just like that it? there's not any mechanism that says the 92,000 resident elk hunters wouldn't go to one zone, yeah. but they don't, Yeah. right? Um, but this is an important thing, and we needed a rule, and the other we needed three elements to be able to implement this thing. Mm-hmm. We need a rule that gives that the legislature gives the commission the authority to do this, and that's working through right now. Okay. And because non-resident revenue from the sale of tags is important to the operation of the department. We don't, we don't want to gut the agency. I mean, one of the frustrations people have, they always say with fish and game, it's all about the money. Yeah. It's all about the money. I hear that a lot too. Well, we are a self-funded agency. Mm -hmm. We get no tax. We get no general tax money. We operate uh, off of the sale of licenses and tags. And non-residents pay a pretty sweet price, and they do make up over half, even though there are only about 10% non-residents in the state, they make up over half of the license income. So that's that's important for people to understand, too, because the, the revenue aspect, the Idaho Fish and Game does not just get tax revenue. Nope, not one it's, cent. It's funded. Um, and, and to hold that thought for a minute... I want to I want to go back and, and say I'm not opposed to non-resident hunters, right? I'm not one of those guys. Nor am I. Uh, I'm a non-resident in 49 other states. I think absolutely. Uh, Randy Newberg or somebody like that said that, and and it makes sense. And I like to hunt in other states as well. Uh, so I, I don't want to be one of those guys. But I think that you clarifying that a lot of these non-residents sometimes they go they 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 hone in on on one particular unit or zone so it gives off this perception that this this huge influx of non-residents have been coming in uh clogging up some of these mountains and drainages and stuff like that it makes a lot of that that, that was one of the purposes of getting you on this podcast mm-hmm. to create this kind of clarity yeah so um that's awesome uh so going back so to what we were just saying the revenue is important yeah the revenue right? is super important but not unto, I mean, so you don't just continue to stand it up because the revenue is important. So what we're trying, we recognize that, so we've run through the modeling, and we know if the commission limits non-resident participation in over-the-counter hunts to, let's say, no more than 15% non-residents, mm-hmm. there are not a lot of the non-residents. So if currently if zone X has 35% non-residents and in the future we can't have more than 15%, that's a 50% reduction. That's that's a huge deal. And you got to guess they're not going to go hunt in another zone because there's a reason they're going to that zone. They've been looking at the hunt planner, success rates high, percent six point bull and archery harvest is high. That's where they want to go. So we're probably not going to be selling out our non-resident tags anymore once we implement this. And that yeah. means and that means we're going to suffer fiscally. So the the other thing in this is a non-resident fee increase. 
So we're going to charge them more for the opportunity to hunt deer and elk and some other things. But deer and elk are going up substantially. A couple of reasons. One, it's been a bargain. It has. It's only like, what, 582 or 600, something like that? So an elk tag right now for a non-resident is 415. And what? The, and the proposed. a lot less well, than I thought. Then you got to have a hunting license, too. But So the total oh, cost gotcha. is closer to 600 Okay, uh, that makes sense. Non-resident elk tags are proposed to go to 650 Yeah, I was just looking in but Montana, we, and I, we're like half of that. Yeah, that includes the hunting license. But, yeah, yeah. Um, so, again, this is something that residents have been telling us for a long time, too, hmm. that the non-resident fees are too cheap. And you should raise the fees, and we should have fewer non-residents. So we're doing both of those things. The third thing we need, Jim, to be able to pull this off is a is a licensed vendor who can limit the number of tags in Unit 73 for non-residents, yet not limit the number of tags for residents in whatever the unit might be. And what do you mean a licensed vendor? So the people that sell our licenses for us, that's a contract. So they don't have the capability to do that the, now? The or? vendor we currently have doesn't, the, but we have gone out. So we've got this rule going through the legislature. We've got a law going through the legislature to raise the fees. Mm-hmm. And we just um, finished an RFQ for a new license vendor. We've our current license vendor has underperformed. And, and if you've been buying licenses and you know that like the fading ink issue and oh, some yeah, of the, that was, uh, so we're going to have a new vendor and they're, and uh, they're going to yeah. be able to stand this system up for us. And so we've got to hit all these three things to be able to implement this. Yeah. That's an interesting story. Two years ago, uh, I, I got a white tail, pulled my tag out of my wallet. Right. It was blank. Yep. It was absolutely blank. I now I knew about where to mark, um, but it, it was it was totally blank. So that's interesting you say. I was wondering about that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So we some other frustrations, but in any regard, I don't I don't want to dwell on it. Other yeah. than to say we are we have a new licensed vendor under contract right now. They are working to develop our system, which will include the ability to limit non-resident tags by unit or zone in over-the-counter hunts. So, when, when do you foresee all this kind of taking place? Uh, for next hunting season, next hunting season 21. Okay. So the tag fee increase, again, this stuff has to get done through the legislature, but the, the commission um, has made it a priority. It's been part, the governor approved the legislative package and the rule package, and we've got tremendous resident support for those folks that have been paying attention to it Fantastic. and um i think it's i think it's long overdue and and i think it addresses a lot of the things so yeah. you get some folks who say you know fishing game never listens to me well we do we just don't always do what you want that, <laughs> this think, is one of those things yeah. that, that we're really putting uh those pieces together and and we've not been in a position to do it before from a technological standpoint Imagine when you were writing paper licenses to be able to do that. Yeah, right. So right. anyway, the pieces are coming together. I hope folks are happy about that. And I think that's one of the questions that I had on there is is I think that there is kind of this feeling among hunters that um, – and it, it, this is this is going to be kind of with a with a marker that, that, that stating that this is for hunters that are not involved – in meetings or getting online and and just uh, where where they're invited to make comments or fill out surveys, there's a lot of hunters that don't do that, mm-hmm. and they tend to be the same hunters that say, "Well, fishing game never listens to me." Um, not to say that sometimes I think that there is some warranted uh, contention there in terms of sometimes we do feel like we're not getting listened to. I understand. And sometimes we do feel like um, maybe some anti-hunting group. Is, is having this really loud voice, and we, we're concerned that it's they're either we're being heard or, or they're being heard louder than, than we are mm-hmm. uh, or listened to more than we are. Can we talk about that for a minute? Sure. Um, what kind of what kind of voices do you get from the anti-hunting movement in Idaho? So I would rather answer that from what kind of influence do anti-hunters have on the okay. commission? Okay, yeah, no, I'm good with that, and I, what, and I like that. And they really don't have any influence on the commission. The commission um, 
looks at facts and they know. So we have seen other states and we know that we had a run at a ballot initiative in Idaho in 96 to limit bear baiting and hound hunting. Mm -hmm. That went down about a 60-40 margin. But we know other states, their wildlife is being managed by ballot initiative. And a lot of that is driven by the anti-hunting community. And that is not a way to manage wildlife. Wildlife should never be managed by popular vote. Well, I, I agree. And it states that in the law, like you that, that you were talking about earlier. It's got to be science-based. It and does. And we also in Idaho recently have a constitutional amendment. So it has also stood up in the Idaho Constitution, the public's right. It's a public right to hunt, fish, mm-hmm. and trap. And that hunting and fishing and trapping is the preferred method of managing wildlife in this state. And, and that's been an important part. But the commission is aware of what anti-hunting movements are doing. But anti-hunting movements don't get any traction with the commission. But at the same time, Jim, in Idaho, we are aware of it, and you try not to do things that are super outlandish because there are a bunch of folks, even in Idaho, who aren't hunters but accept hunting because Mm -hmm. their friends do it, their neighbors do it, their husbands do it, their wives do it, and they get it. It's a culture and a lifestyle here. But you can go too far and start to turn people off. So I would just tell you that the commission has an awareness of these things that society continues to say hunting is acceptable or where you cross a boundary and all of a sudden it doesn't look a lot like fair chase or it doesn't hold up the tenets of the North American model. And so the commission does have an awareness of that, but but they really are not influenced by anti-hunters. Has there been an influx in in voices from anti-hunting organizations in in Idaho specifically? Um, It's always there in the background, but I would say that those folks tend to focus more in target-rich environments where they're making headway. We were we were talking um, earlier. I think I, I don't think we'd started recording yet about the recent uh, wolf proposal that just it was approved to so essentially there's like you know uh, year-round wolf hunting right and and there was this huge disproportionate number of people make uh, filling out that survey that was going around um, from out of staters mm-hmm. can you talk about what kind of influence the out of staters have on those types of surveys so you know with me you you're probably learning this right now there is no short answer Right? That's okay. So, <laughs> There's no short question for me either. Sorry. <laughs> the, f- the first thing um, I want you and the listeners to understand is we do work really hard to get public opinion. That's really important in the commission's de- deliberation about what they're going to do is to get give the public, whoever it is from wherever, the opportunity to weigh in. Mm-hmm. And there are random surveys and there are non-random surveys in which anybody can weigh in but it doesn't a non-random survey does not give you the ability to say and this is representative of the public the survey we just did is representative of the 27,000 people who felt they needed to let us know what was on their mind but it is not random, and it does not describe what people as a whole in Idaho think or what people outside of Idaho think. It just tells us what those people who decided to weigh in. So hmm. you have to understand the differences in survey. So when the, when the commission says, tell us what you think in a non-random way, you can't make generalizations from those, in, those data that this is the way the world thinks. Mm -hmm. It's only the way the people that answered the survey think. The real value of a random survey, it's kind of like an exit poll at a voting thing. You take these people at random and you can predict what everybody is doing. 
So gotcha. we do random surveys. When we want to know what deer hunters think about deer hunting, we go to our database of people that have bought a deer tag in the last 10 years, and there's 300,000 different Idahoans who have bought a deer tag in the last 10 years, and we randomly pull 7,000 names out of that group of people randomly Mm -hmm. and send them a survey. And because that's a random selection of deer hunters, we feel much more comfortable in saying the responses of this random survey help us know what all the deer hunters think. Yeah, it makes me feel so much better. Okay. (laughs) We'll still get criticized by the guy who said, well, I didn't get one. I didn't get the survey, so it's not representative of what I think. Yeah. And I can't get there, right? We can't survey all 300,000 people that bought a deer tag in the last 10 years. But if you do it randomly, that's what science is about. Yeah. You, you can describe what the, the public thinks. So the, you I just a consensus. Yeah. I just wanted to say that this these 27,000 comments on wolves were not random. They're not reflective of what Idaho. You, you can't describe the country's opinion on wolf management from these. But you can say that most of the folks from out of state that weighed in did not support these nine proposals. Oh, I, without a doubt. Um, they were putting it on, like, pro-wolf organizations in the sure. state of Con- Colorado looking to push that initiative down there. And, and I, mean, I mean, just from that standpoint, you think of if somebody got a hold of that in a big group in L.A., right, right. in California, they could all comment and overwhelm the entire state of Idaho just right. from L.A., Right, And so that, that was a concern, so I'm glad you clarified that. So the commission takes that in perspective, mm-hmm. right? And so as they, as they look at the things and as the law tells them to do, ascertainment of fact. So what are the facts about wolf management? And what is the trend in the wolf population? And what, what are the facts? Mm-hmm. And so when the commission... You have a question that we're going to get to, and I guess we're going to get to it right now we about, can get to it about, now. about wolf management, and um, it's a long story, yeah. right? So wolves were introduced into the state under a, a 10J rule south of I-90, which under the Endangered Species Act, 10J is an experimental non-essential population, which gives the state more flexibility in the regulatory sense, to deal with problems when Mm -hmm. they occur. Well, from 35 wolves introduced, basically in the hardest and wilderness areas, and a recovery objective of 10 packs and 100 wolves in Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana each, so Mm -hmm. 30 packs and 300, Idaho put a buffer on that of 50 and, and 5 packs. We surpassed that in three or four years. Yeah. Boom. And wanted to delist because we we met the recovery criteria. And under 10J, we had had some opportunity to manage problems and conflicts. Then it got litigated. And so the federal government's, quote, unquote, promise to delist them after we met some population objective didn't happen because it got held up in federal court Mm -hmm. year after year. After a year, it was held up in federal court. Just about a decade, wasn't it? Just about. And the population grows by 30 or 35 percent a year. By the time Congress had finally had enough of it, and we got a congressional delisting that wasn't subject to judicial review, that was 2011. Okay. And the population was well beyond. Yeah. Six, seven hundred wolves at that point. Well, and, and we'll get into how many. But um, that's why we had more on the landscape because it was held up in court and they couldn't be delisted and the state couldn't get management. And when we did get management, the population was considerably higher, orders of magnitude higher than what the state had agreed to yeah. with the federal government originally. So we were behind the power curve on wolf numbers and wolf management. And the first five years after delisting, you're quote-unquote on probation Mm -hmm. to make sure that the regulatory mechanisms you have in place 
will in fact perpetuate wolves on the landscape at or above the recovery threshold level. So the commission kind of eased into wolf hunting and trapping over those five years. But I've got some stuff to leave with you to show you the progression of time, place, and method that the commission advanced wolf hunting and trapping seasons across the state over time. Yeah. Longer seasons, more liberal seasons, more gear available. We had mandatory wolf trapping rules to get trappers trained up on ethics and non-target catch, etc. So the commission, I believe every time they met for big game season regulations from 2011 to 2019, incrementally added more opportunity for the harvest of wolves. And, and we've seen that in the way that uh, the, the seasons have gotten longer, the tag allotment has gotten larger. All right, guys, that concludes part one of my interview with Ed Schriever, uh, director of the Idaho Fishing Game. I want to just thank him one more time for coming all the way up here and joining me in an episode here. I think we got a lot of good content. I really like the guy. Uh, I, I hope you guys are getting a lot out of this. I think we're uh, we're between this episode and part two that's coming out next week. This, uh, there's so much ground that we cover throughout everything about regarding wildlife management. In the next episode, we dive really deep into wolf management, uh, what the Idaho Fishing Game is doing about wolves. Uh, we we talk about elk deprivation hunts, uh, things like that. So it's there's a lot of really good stuff in episode two. So do not forget to tune in next week. Uh, it'll be available Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. Um, in the meantime, be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and obviously you can go to thewesternhuntsman.com. we got some cool T-shirts and a few stickers and stuff like that coming out. And we will see you guys next week. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.